Hello everyone, this is Jason Kendall and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. This time we're continuing our study of neutron stars and seeing how we actually observe neutron stars because they're really tiny. So how do we even know they exist? And that's the real question on today. And that's what we're going to talk about is how we know neutron stars exist and they're known by the name of pulsars. So let's go back and again look at what we learned from a neutron star last time which was it's really small, it's really dense, it's kind of like an atomic nucleus all on its own, it's, the magnetic field is extraordinarily large and the escape speed is nearly the speed of light, light bends around it and if you drop something from a meter above it, it will, it will hit the ground with an explosion that would be the equivalent of many nuclear bombs. So, yeah, these are extreme, extreme objects. And deep in the core, they might be quark-type states. There's these weird pasta-like states, and it's very strange. But they, and they're forged in the moments of, of an enormous, enormous explosion called a Type II supernova. All right, so let's look at how they were discovered. They were discovered by accident in 1967 when Jocelyn Bell, who was a grad student under Anthony Hewish, who was her advisor, and they were looking for very rapidly pulsating radio sources. And what they were doing is they were hunting for, uh, they were hunting for oscillations in the solar wind. So their study was the solar wind. So they set up a series of radio antenna arrays on a big, big, big field and watched for the watched as the sun went overhead and they looked for and they watched the sky to see what was the what the scintillations were at radio frequencies. And so they were looking for very short period variations because they're looking for scintillation of, uh, due to the due to the solar wind. And so they were taking really uh, fast samples and trying to actually do a big amplification on top because it's basically a big radio amplifier. And what they found was they found that something was pulsing. So they found a pulsar that was pulsing at about, about a millisecond or once millisecond long pulses. These tiny, tiny, tiny pulses once every second or so at a very, very repeated rate. And what happened was is that they just thought this was an amazing, amazing object. And Anthony Hewish, even though, well, Jocelyn Bell actually discovered it, she was pouring through the data. And the reason she discovered it is because they left the array running overnight and when the sun wasn't in the sky they found something that was doing this pulsing this regular regular pulsing in the sky and in fact the technology for it existed but just nobody had ever done this kind of study before so they didn't know what they found so she did the analysis she made the discovery but because she was a graduate student under Dr. Hewish who was running the entire experiment uh, he got the Nobel Prize and she did not now, this is an interesting little study, case study in the nature of, of things, but really even Jocelyn Bell herself said, look, this wasn't worthy of a Nobel Prize for me to get. And in fact, she said that later on, after he won the Nobel Prize, that the, um, the point was is that he would get all the blame if it didn't, if it fell apart. So he gets all the blame, so he gets all the credit. And there were just people working under him. It's not like it was her idea to start the entire project. It was his. So, but yet still people think of, people always still remember Jocelyn Bell as the graduate student that got passed over for a Nobel Prize. Anyway, her discovery and, uh, and subsequent confirmation by others showed that there were these radio pulses that occurred in very, very, very short pulses on extremely repeatable rates. So what they discovered is that this could actually be explained by a pulsar, and they called them pulsars. And the thing is, is that they said, well, they're rap so we explain this by saying they're rapidly spinning magnetized neutron stars. And so they're the magnetic field, so they actually, they, they actually tried to determine what the heck these pulses were. And they said, well, we've learned about variable stars, so they could say, could it be a star that's pulsing really fast, like in and out, like, like getting bigger and smaller, bigger and smaller, so it would do these pulses. And there would be no known mechanism for it to actually collapse back down. And so they thought of many other possibilities. Maybe it's a fast rotating planet, or maybe a fast moving object, or maybe little green men. That was one of the initial ideas, was that, wow, maybe it's an alien signal, but when they found others, they said, nope, it ain't that. So they actually tried to figure out what it could possibly be. And they said, well, what if it's an actually a rotating star with a hot spot? And they thought, well, this is extremely bright, uh, ex extremely fast rotation. 
and they determined that the that an object that was very distant, distant enough to actually glow in this type of way, and emit the kind of radiation that they found, it would have to fly apart in order to the object would 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 spin itself apart. So there was no known astronomical object other than a neutron star that could actually hold itself together and spin once every millisecond, which is what they found later, is that there are millisecond pulsars. So maybe 10 times or 100 times a second or tens of times or maybe a few times a second. And the only thing it could hold itself together was a neutron star. Everything else would literally fly apart. And so what you have is you the, the model of such a spinning object is you have a very strong magnetic field and the magnetic field creates beams of radiation as the electrons themselves spiral around in the magnetic field and are accelerated from the surface of the neutron star all the way out along the magnetic field and as they do so those hot spots then become beams uh, because the electrons then drop the, uh, emit their radiation because of synchrotron radiation which we talked about previously and synchrotron radiation means that they are spiraling at nearly the speed of light in an extraordinarily strong magnetic field and so that is beamed, and so these become beams. And the magnetic field of, it does not have to be aligned with the spin axis, just in the same way the Earth's rotation axis is not aligned with its magnetic field axis. Uh, then the, in the same way a neutron star's magnetic field is not necessarily aligned with its spin axis. So if we're in the direction of one of these beams, then we see a, a blip. If we're not in the direction of the beam, then we don't see a blip, and that's that. So the, this particular thing would create enormous bright spots in optical radio, x-ray, and gamma ray. It would, spin, it would make, a, make, a, make light in all of them. So what we find is here's a, a better axis, better concept of it. So the magnetic field lines are attached to or come, are, are part of the neutron star. The spin axis is up and down. The equatorial plane goes left and right. And the magnetic field is misaligned. So the red arrows demonstrate the radiation that's coming from both the hot spot as well as the electrons and, part, and even ions are spiraling in the magnetic field at nearly the speed of light and emitting synchrotron radiation. It is thought that the magnetic field would be so strong at the surface of the neutron star at those hot spots that it actually lifts the electrons off of there and the, the act of lifting that releases energy in the form of light. Now you'll notice that the neutron star can spin pretty fast, like milliseconds, and some of them, as we saw in the last episode, can spin maybe a quarter of the speed of light. But that means the magnetic field has to spin that fast. And so the magnetic field itself, at the edge and the boundaries, there must be some boundary where the magnetic field, the tips of the magnetic field away on the equatorial plane are going around at the speed of light because if it's fixed in there, those magnetic fields don't get, are not, are, don't get dragged, they're, they're kind of like, it's the field lines, they move with it, so they must rotate. So at some point the magnetic field must rotate around at the speed of light and that's where the, the pulsar becomes a wind because now the magnetic field breaks down and then the electrons and things can spiral out along those wind-like lines going left and right or along the equator of it. And that can fling electrons out at nearly the speed of light and, and ions out nearly the speed of light on unconnected magnetic field lines. So the magnetic field is very strong nearby and it's a very disruptive magnetic field nearby. Just like we talked about the sun with, its, with the solar wind, this is just that on ultra, ultra, 10 to the 15th, 10 to the 30th steroids. That's what that is. So the hot spots are where the, ele the electrons get lifted because of the strong magnetic field. They emit light and they also spiral in the magnetic field and form the beams of radiation that we see as a lighthouse. And so here's an example of a pulsar that has its magnetic field rotating and so the beams are coming out of the hot spots and so what we're going to do is we're going to follow it as it rotates faster and faster. The electrons make the trace out the field lines as they spiral around and emit light as synchrotron radiation, but the neutron star itself is hot. Remember, it's about a million degrees, million Kelvin, so it's insanely bright. And now as it passes in our direction, we see a bright spot, a, a pulse of light that comes from the pulsar, but only if we're right in the line of that. And I'm sorry if that triggered anybody, you know, maybe somebody's got some kind of crazy thing going on where they can't actually look at that stuff, but we see that the magnetic field is, is an integral part of the pulsar model. 
And so there's our picture and much more artistic rendition with the electrons spiraling on the blue magnetic fields. But the, really, the magnetic field wouldn't be like blue like this. It would be a cloud as a, that would be a real mixed up cloud that would almost be rigid. You would actually expect the total energy density in that to be so strong then how much material would be cruising along in it that those field lines would actually feel rigid. They would hit you and they would actually have, so if you were there, another one of the next million ways to die is that if the field lines smacked into you, you would be whacked and sent along in a very, very, uh, in, in quite a pitch to the, into the cosmos as it smacked into you. So those magnetic field lines look gossamer, but they would actually be almost solid. Uh, that's an interesting thought. So here's another uh, version of what we would see, maybe the effect of a pulsar on a supernova remnant. Remember, these are formed as a result of a type 2 supernova as a supermassive star explodes. And so the pulsar itself, as it rotates around, generates an enormous magnetic field. The beams of light carry huge amounts of gamma rays. The gamma rays then illuminate and excite the material around them, causing the supernova remnant to glow. So many of the supernova remnants that we see, and what we'll talk about later, actually are glowing as a result of the magnetic field energy that's being pumped into them from this tiny, tiny, tiny source. So the supernova remnant that we see there might actually be a light year or two in size. I remember the and a light year is 10 to the 13th meters, right? But the neutron star is only about 10 or so kilometers. So that dot that's in there is actually completely invisible. Actually, it's not invisible because it's extremely hot, so it's emitting x-rays and optical light. So you get this tiny, tiny, tiny thing that's exceedingly hot and emitting huge amounts of light and energy. All right, so because they do that, pulsars evolve. And we don't see them, of course, if their jets aren't pointing our way. And pulsars will radiate their energy away very rapidly. And that, that's because the, the magnetic field will it will cause the light to occur, and if it's emitting light, it's losing energy. If it's losing energy, then it must slow down because basically this is one big dynamo. And so we can think of it as uh, in just the same way as how do you get power out of, out of, out of a hydroelectric dam? Well, you basically put a whole bunch of magnetic uh, turbines, and the turbines that the water flows over are bar magnets. And so you just spin the bar magnets, and if you spin a bar magnet, you generate an electric current. When you generate an electric current, that makes that hot spot in the neutron star. That's what we see. This is generated current from a magneto, from a, from a dynamo effect. But then the dynamo effect creates electricity. So literally the water imparts some of its energy into the fan, into the spot, into the, uh, into, well, it imparts a significant amount of energy into the paddles that it goes down through a hydroelectric dam and it spins those things up really fast. And so basically we convert gravitational energy, potential energy into electricity and that's how a hydroelectric dam works. And that takes, it makes the water fall slower after it goes down the dam and across those things. In just the same way, the energy that is released by the pulsar as it spins means the pulsars spin slower as they age as they lose rotational energy. When they're young, they're fast, and they're old, they're slow. And so if they're slow, they don't do the pulsing dance, and they don't, it, and they don't have as much as strong, as strong a magnetic field. That starts to weaken. And that basic, well, they still could have an incredibly strong magnetic field, but there's no rotational energy left in order to drive a dynamo effect. So older supernova remnants are almost undetectable. However, they're found all over the sky, and this is from the Fermi Space Telescope looking in gamma rays. And so these are radio pulsars found with the, with, that are part of the Fermi Unidentified Sources. So Fermi Space Telescope goes out and looks for gamma ray sources, and what we can do then is uh, collate those gamma ray sources with radio sources, and that's what's been done here, and all those little circles are discovered, discovered, uh, pulsars inside of the inside of, uh, of from the from the gamma ray sources from Fermi gamma ray telescope in the sky so this is an all sky view showing a series of showing a series of discovered locations 
uh, in the sky for pulsars. So they emit both gamma rays and radio as well as optical light as well. Again, as they get older and older, they get cooler and cooler. And so when you have isolated neutron stars, which they will be after time because the supernova remnant that, that, that came out of them as they exploded spreads out into space, seeding other stars, making, helping clouds make planets and things. But the neutron star gets left behind. It's all by itself. And sometimes you can actually be, uh, there's maybe a chance that one can actually see them. And so this is something, this is an isolated neutron star found by the Hubble Space Telescope. And looking at it with also a couple of extreme, with uh, extreme ultraviolet explorer, which it looks in the UV and X-ray from ROSAT to actually confirm, yes, this actually is a pulsar and trying to figure out how far this one is. Now, getting the distance to something would allow, and knowing its brightness would be able to get you, get you the size. So this is pretty good that it's in front of some molecular cloud that's about 400 light years away. So it's got to be closer than that. And yet it's incredibly, incredibly hot because it's emitting mostly in the X-rays. And it's really, really, really small because it's so dim. So if it's 25th magnitude visual invisible light, which is, which is almost on the boundary of what Hubble Space Telescope can actually find, and it's only four, it's less than 400 light years away, it has to be insanely small, about a few miles across, in order for it to be, in order for it to actually... Uh, be visible to us. So any isolated neutron star that we would act, actually be able to see in x-rays and optical light is probably very, is actually relatively nearby, which leads us to think that there's probably hundreds of millions of these neutron stars orbiting the Milky Way because there's a lot of metals, meaning gold, nickel, iron, and other heavy elements all up and down the periodic table that were produced in supernovas. So there has to be a lot of these things. Luckily, the Milky Way is really big, and these things aren't necessarily ever going to come into the space of the solar system. And the Earth is four and a half billion years old, and the chances that a neutron star will pass inside the solar system are practically zero. So we're probably safe, even though there's hundreds of millions of these things out there. That's wild thought. That, 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 that even that was, is nothing. And so as one looks at the size scales of the cosmos, that makes more sense. But this gives you an example of just like, well, these things are really so far away that we would never actually encounter them. All right, so can we actually encounter a, uh, a, a supernova or a neutron star? And the answer is kind of. And in, the his, in history, we did talk about some supernovae in the past. On July 4th, 1054, a new star appeared in the sky. It was brighter than Venus for almost two, for over two, uh, about two years, uh, greater than, uh, yeah, almost two years, and was even seen by the Anasazi. So on the right, we see what the vision is from Chaco Canyon and, then a, and a glyph from ancient, uh, from ancient Chinese uh, astrologers who, who way back in 1054 also documented it. There are other documents as well, but these are cool pictures I chose to show to you. And the Crab Nebula kind of looks like this. On the bottom, that's today's view of the Crab Nebula supernova remnant, and in the center of it is a pulsar, and we see the image of it pulsing above. And that pulse is happening, this is, this is happening faster than that, but we're actually looking at it in an optical light or infrared light, so we can actually get a picture of it. And that means we're kind of looking at it in a kind of strange way. You know how you can kind of uh, see a helicopter blade going backwards if you flash a strobe at it? Or if you have some something moving in a circle really fast, you hear a strobe at it, or just look at it with like a, with like an uh, uh, an overhead uh, an overhead fluorescent light bulb, which has that buzzing sound that makes a definite flicker. So the flickering allows you to see it. So this imaging says we we take a series of pictures rapidly in sequence with a definite with a definite space between them, and hope we can catch these things. So. This was actually caught, and it actually does have that double pulse. So there is actually a two pulse to pulse for this neutron star in the center of the Crab Nebula. Now the Crab Nebula itself is emitting huge amounts of X-rays and gamma rays, and it is this, the brightest X-ray source in the sky. In fact, when people talk about uh, X-ray sources, or they say they've actually measured in terms of crabs. So how many, is it a millicrab source? Is it a macro, is it a microcrab source? Is it a demicrab source? Because the crab nebula is the brightest thing in the sky. And so 
every other x-ray source can be measured in terms of how bright is it compared to the crab. That's kind of an interesting way of thinking about it. So the crab nebula is the brightest object in the sky in x-rays. Um, and it's located pretty close at about 6,500 light years away. Uh, and the diameter of that whole thing is about 11 light years. So this one little neutron star, a neutron star that's only about 10 miles in diameter, is actually pumping out so much energy that it can illuminate and cause to glow an enormous cloud of expanding gas that's, that is, that's, part, that's from the shredded, from the shredded supernova of that star uh, back in 1054. And the speed it's going is almost 1,500 kilometers per second. So this has actually been measured to actually go, um, to, actually, uh, to actually see the motion. So Hubble Space Telescope keeps revisiting the Crab Nebula, and we can see the clouds and move with time. And we see also that the Crab Nebula can be measured at going about 30 times a second. So that's really fast to, to have something really small rotating that quickly. And this is interesting, this Crab Nebula image, because if we go then look at multi-wavelength versions, we took the image that we had before and we call it a different color. So now we're mixing three different colors of light. And the yellow wispiness that we saw is the image that we just saw, just converted into black and white and then colored yellow. The red sort of ambient glow is infrared light from dusty material. And then the purplish glow in the center is due to x-rays. And that's the x-ray emission, that purplish glow in the center, which actually seems to have a slightly different structure. But there's actually, but it even seems to be pushing these cavities around. So you can see the x-ray glow seems to be pushing cavities around and, and making bubbles and holes. And this combines the, ver the, the x-ray data in blue is from the Chandra X-ray Telescope. And the red is from the Spitzer Infrared Space Telescope. And of course, the yellow is the Hubble Space Telescope. Now the neutron star is, we saw the, from the lighthouse model, that it's creating this enormous, enormous magnetic field which is shooting particles out all over the place. And uh, let's see what that actually looks like. Because the Crab Nebula itself, that central region that's glowing in, in, the, in, uh, in x-rays, has a central disk and a couple of jets. And there's like this twisty jet that's coming from the center and that bright dot right in the center, that's the neutron star. And, it's, and we can actually get a picture of this um, with the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, the Crab Nebula itself is a very, very tiny image in the sky. And this is a tinier yet image. It's only a few, uh, it's only a, it's only a few tens, of arc seconds, uh, tens of arc seconds across. But still, what we see is that there's this wispy type of structure. And there's these, they're merging to form these rings. So there's an inner ring that's glowing and an outer ring that's glowing. And those two rings are, are material that's being flung out at nearly the speed of light into the outer ring. And so that's causing enormous motion. So there's an inter and this is, has an animation, which the Chandra group has actually created for us. So the Chandra X-ray telescope has been observing it over many years and actually can see the motion of it. So this is just zooming in because you can just like zoom in, you know, just like you zoom in when you try to look at a picture on your phone or something. So just zooming in, but so we can see the waves of material moving away from the neutron star and along the jet. So material is coming out of that neutron star from the surface of it, the equatorial region that where the, pul where the pulsar's magnetic field is approaching the speed of light, flings material out at nearly the speed of light, and it slams into the materials on the side, emitting huge amounts of x-rays. So most of the x-rays in that cloudy structure happen because of electrons and ions that have been accelerated to nearly the speed of light, and as they collide with other things, they, they shock heat the gas to x-rays and emit x-rays. The rest of it is due to extraordinarily powerful magnetic fields that occur inside of there. So, the, and so the, there is a huge voltage difference that occurs along the, because of the strong magnetic field, and that's the thing that accelerates the electrons off of the surface. And by that huge voltage difference actually releases an enormous amount of energy as they're pulled off of the surface of, off of the surface of the neutron star 
because they have to release, they have to, they have to overcome the pull of gravity. So the new, the magnetic field is creating a voltage difference. The voltage difference has to overcomes the pull of gravity, and in so doing, releases light because that's how it has to. That's that's the releasing of energy in that particular fashion. So we get these polar jets that occur that come from the north and south pole that are not because of the rotation axis of the magnetic field. The magnetic field is making those waves. All right. So I invite you to go take a look at that because that's, kind of, that's really cool because that actually shows movement of something at 6,500 light years away, which is just wild to think. And here is a view, uh, a more recent image of, from the Hubble Space Telescope of the Crab Nebula. And you can definitely see the pulsar definitely smack in the center. We can see the wispy cloudy structures that occur because of the, um, because of the vast magnetic field permeating this entire thing. And if you got within a light year of that thing, it would completely wipe out the hard drives of any computing facility there. And if you got within an astronomical unit of it, it would tear everything apart. Because, well, no, it's still a solar mass, but if you got within, say, a couple of radii from it, it would definitely rip everything apart there. So you don't want to get very close to that because that, per, that cloudy structure is permeated with a, with a stronger magnetic field than can be made on Earth. And you can still see the, um, the wispy structure of the jet-like material that comes out that makes a dusty jet that looks kind of like a dark tendril that points away from the, from the crab net, from the pulsar. And so you've got a bright inner ring. Uh, that inner ring is where the light is being generated by shock heating and forming x-rays. That x-rays then, and this is a Hubble image, invisible light, the x-rays then uh, step down as they interact with the material in the cloud to make it glow and the magnet and the ions then cruise through these this very complex magnetic field that permeates the whole thing as the closed mag as the unclosed magnetic field lines try to recombine uh, even as the shock waves itself push the entire nebula apart so the study of the crab nebula is the thing that you do if you want to learn pulsars and neutron stars because it is the nearest neutron star that's doing major activity and in fact the crab nebula as Messier object number one is an easy fit target in small telescopes and you can actually see this thing in an 8 inch telescope from a dark location on Earth. So that's really interesting to think that that's something that happened there can be seen so easily. Well, let's look at other ones. So about 11,000 years ago, there was another supernova, the Vela that in, in the constellation Vela exploded. And we see that wispy sort of sort of bubbly structure that's in the middle, not the, th not the bright spherical pink in the up top and not the bright yellow reddish in the upper left, but no, the wispy bubbly stuff that looks that kind of looks foamy in the middle and not the blue thing at the top that's just an internal reflection of the telescope from the uh, from the digital sky survey so the that is uh, the super the remnant supernova remnant from the pulsar that created this thing and so the vela pulsar is part of this and those outer layers crash into the interstellar medium and you can see there's a lot of gas and dust in this area and as that material crashes into it it shock heats it and makes it glow. So material is just completely, completely hitting all of this stuff. And it was exploded about 11,000 years ago. And as the material crashes into other stuff, it makes it glow. And that's where that glow comes from. And this image that we see spans almost about 100 light years. And the object itself is about the diameter. And this is about 20 times the diameter of the full moon. So this is a big, 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 big composite image from the uh, uh, Digital Sky Survey, which is an amazing, amazing piece of work by Davy DeMartin at Sky Factory. It's a fantastic piece of work. So what's fascinating is, is that in my feeling is that 11,000 years ago was when the first structures were being built on Earth. In fact, the first human structure was uh, Gobekli Tepe, and that was built about 9,000 BC, which corresponds to roughly when this thing went off. And it would have been visible from Turkey where Gobekli Tepe was, it was built. So perhaps 11,000 years ago, the first people said, saw this bright star in the sky and somebody said, that's a god and I'm going to make it one. So build this big temple. So go take a look at what that is.
anyway, so the Vela Pulsar is something that is actually seen in the sky. Uh, when we look at it, it's about a thousand. It's about a thousand light years away. It's nearer than the other. It's about it's about twelve miles across. So this is actually nearer than the Crab Nebula. Actually, it's a slower rotating pulsar. It's about eighty nine milliseconds. But still, that thing is rotating faster than a helicopter. And there's a jet in the center that's moving about seventy percent the speed of light. And we're going to look at some Chandra X-ray data from the summer of 2011. As it zooms in on the center of the Vela Pulsar, we see the Chandra data in blue in the center. So it's going to get rid of the optical view that we see, just showing us the Vela Pulsar in X-ray light. Now, the Vela Pulsar itself is also deeply studied by Chandra. So now we're going to zoom in on the central pulsar that created the supernova remnant we saw and that thing actually moves over time. So there's a central, central, central object, and there we see the motion of the Vela Pulsar. We see the jets moving out at approximately 70% the speed of light. The pulsar is deep in the center, and we see the material rocketing away from the, uh, from the, disky, the disk that makes it. So there's kind of a bent sort of appearance of a disk-like structure. That's the material coming off of the, the rotation axis of the pulsar, as it's going at nearly the speed of light and the material just whips away from it and the magnetic field then excites that material so it's shocked and glowing in x-rays. But the jets are material that's going so fast as they slam in the interstellar medium they make x-rays as well as glow by synchrotron radiation. So that's the interesting thing about the Vela pulsar which is a fantastic study and it too is something that is visible, uh, very difficult to see. In fact, it's only visible, the Vela pulsar is only visible in x-rays. However, pulsars in general, uh, the crab is one, and there's another one called Gaminga, and Gaminga is primarily an x-ray, is primarily an x-ray and gamma-ray pulsar, but it's very close to the sky to the crab. And the Gaminga pulsar is a 24 millisecond, is a quarter of a second pulsar, which is another interesting one. They all pulse just like the others. And so we also can find that sometimes they come in binaries. Because remember we talked a while back in a previous lecture that stars come in binaries? So sometimes we can get binary neutron stars or neutron stars that are part of a binary system. And we can see x-rays that are happening in bursts. So then these happen in these, instead of pulses, bursts of x-rays that happen and then they fade. And maybe there's some pulsation that happens because there's neutron star activity, uh, like a pulsar. And then all of a sudden there's a massive uptick in X-ray luminosity. And that's called an X-ray burster as part of a binary neutron star set. And that would kind of look like this. So if you have a neutron star, instead of a white dwarf now, remember the type 1 supernova was a white dwarf with a companion big star? Now imagine that it's a neutron star. Somehow a super, a really massive star evolved, went supernova, its companion maybe received some of the material or some of it was actually blown apart and accelerated the evolution of it. Now it becomes a red giant. As it becomes a red giant, it swells to fill the Roche lobe. Material falls once it gets close enough so that the gravitational field is greater than the uh, towards the neutron star than the center of the other star it falls into a disk there's a hot spot where it contacts that very 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 hot dense disk the disk is highly magnetized of course because it's a neutron star and can bend the path of the can bend the path of the material as it falls in and since the magnetic field of a neutron star is much more powerful than a white dwarf the path of it can then be redirected towards the poles where all of a sudden it does these huge, huge, huge bursts of energy. And once it piles up enough stuff, there is massive thermonuclear explosions that can occur on the surface of the neutron star. And when they do that, we get a burst of x-rays. And so we get a binary neutron star making x-ray bursts. All right. So those the binary neutron stars are what well, they pulsars are roughly between uh, three hundredths of a second about a third of a second and those are called millisecond but the but a star like we showed can become a millisecond pulsar or a, like one thousandth of a second and they had to get spun up and so the act of falling onto the neutron star actually imparts the spin of the material orbiting it that then lands on it as it goes around and around and around 
it spit that spin of the disk and the material then imparts that onto the neutron star and that's called a mill and it can actually make the star go faster and faster so when you have an x-ray burster you should also have a millisecond pulsar so let's see what that kind of looks like so the donor star has material that's right on top it creates a disk then you get these beam-like activities of x-rays happening in these beams uh, now the rotation rate would be a lot faster than that because it's a pulsar, right? And so the magnetic field redirects the material onto the surface of the neutron star. The disk material falls on top of it, and as it does so, it gets more and more and more massive, and, and the angular momentum of the disk is imparted to the pulsar and spins and spins and spins faster and faster, spinning it up. So that's rather dizzying. I hope I'm not get, triggering anybody with a uh, with any kind of you know, problem. So this is what it might look like from above. You see the spinning material from, from the neutron star going around and around, and as it gets closer, it spins faster and faster until it gets redirected by the magnetic field to the poles onto the surface of it, and then spinning up the neutron star. So then what will happen is that after it spins up really fast, the material collects on the surface of the neutron star. And by collecting on the surface of the neutron star, it does an enormous X-ray burst as the light actually, as thermonuclear reactions occur. But remember that the, the escape speed from the surface of a neutron star can approach the speed of light. So these balls of fire, this fireball that you just saw at the end, can actually accumulate on the surface. And I'm actually, I'm actually just not going to show, I'll, I'll, I'll skip after this in just a second. But that fireball that we saw can actually accumulate on the surface and rotate with it. And when that burst comes along, that's what we see as the X-ray burst. Because that light from all those, ex from that glows from the, ex from the expanding hot gas, we see it as it glows and it comes into and out of our field of view, thus making an X-ray binary. All right. So binary neutron stars probably are more common because in, in globular clusters, which is interesting. Remember, globular clusters are always those old, old, old stars. So there must have been neutron stars formed in the youth of a globular cluster, and there must be binaries inside of them. So eventually those binaries can, be, can turn into uh, total binaries. So maybe, maybe globular clusters have all these, these kind of things in them. And they're very dense stellar environments. So if they're spun up, you might have actually binary stars that might actually collide. So X-ray sources probably are millisecond pulsars, but you can't get the time resolution on something as distant as a globular cluster in order to know if they actually are millisecond pulsars. But to have so many bright X-ray sources in a globular cluster is, leads us to the suspicion that they are. All right, so maybe in that dense stellar environment of a globular cluster, two of the neutron stars can get close enough to collide. And that is what we can see here, is that eventually, if they get close enough to collide, they would spiral around each other in the center of this globular cluster that the ancient, ancient, ancient stars as a pair of stars, and when they collide, they create a new kind of supernova called a kilonova. And a colliding neutron star makes a kilonova, which is an incredibly powerful supernova of two colliding neutron stars. All right, so we'll watch that video once again, because that's kind of cool as they spin, 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 spin. And we actually have seen an observational evidence for such a kilonova occurring. And I'll show you what we mean again by this. There's a couple of colliding neutron stars. So this is the concept that was done inside of a supernova, uh, inside of a collision simulation. And we can see that such a collision would take less than a second. It would take actually the final throws of it when the two neutron stars start to collide to when they merge into something which is just a mess. And so it's, it's, it's an own new colliding object. Remember the density that it was? This is actually shredding those two things apart, which is astonishing that it could actually do that. So the, the combined magnetic field, speed rotation, orbital rotation, and density of these objects mean when they collide, they make a really, 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 really big explosion called a kilonova. 
and we'll talk about those things when we talk about gravitational waves in the future. So what happens when that happens? What happens if the remnant of the core is supermassive, meaning the core of a star is greater than, say, about three solar masses? If it's bigger than that, then the original star must have had a mass greater than 18 solar masses. If that's the case, and the star is more massive than about 18 solar masses, then neutron degeneracy, which is holding up these, holding up these neutron stars and pulsars, that will fail. And if that fails, there's literally no pressure left in the cosmos that can hold the thing up against collapse, and the object collapses down to zero radius at infinite density. Let's let that sit in for just a second. That's just an absurdity, but there we have it. We'll leave you with an absurdity that is a black hole. Black holes are bizarre, bizarre, bizarre objects. Remember how complex the, the neutron star was? Well, black holes are really simple. So it's kind of a weird thing to think that they are that simple. So here's some review questions just for your have to, so you can have some fun. And we'll see you next time.